test flight three was really, really interesting. Uh, and so let's let's talk about some facts here. I'm going right to the SpaceX page, spacex.com slash launches. And this is the mission Starship Flight 3. Starship returned to integrated flight testing with its third launch from Starbase in Texas. While it didn't happen in a lab or on a test stand, it was absolutely a test. What we achieved on this flight will provide invaluable data to continue rapidly developing Starship. On March 14th, 2024, Starship successfully lifted off at 8.25 a.m. Central Time from Starbase in Texas and went on to accomplish several major milestones and firsts. For the second time, all 33 Raptor engines on the Super Heavy booster started up successfully and completed a full duration burn during ascent. That's huge. They didn't do that on the first test. Starship executed its second successful hot stage separation, powering down all but three of Super Heavy's Raptor engines and successfully igniting the six second stage Raptor engines before separating the vehicles. So they did a hot fire, where a hot separation, where while the first stage was still attached, super heavy, they lit those six engines on Starship so that it could separate and get it on its way to orbit. Following separation, the Super Heavy booster successfully completed its flip maneuver and completed a full boost back burn to send it towards its splashdown point in the Gulf of Mexico. And Super Heavy successfully lit several engines for its first ever landing burn before the vehicle experienced an RUD, that's SpaceX speak for Rapid Unscheduled Disassembly. A fancy way of saying it blew up. <laughs> The booster's flight concluded at approximately 462 meters in altitude and just under seven minutes into the mission. But again, to recap, most rockets, almost entirely all rockets before Starship, aside from Falcon 9 and, say, Blue Origin and their reusable rocket, all of those rockets were doomed to go into the ocean and not necessarily be reused. Companies like Rocket Lab are starting to recover their smaller scale rockets from the ocean, but SpaceX's Starship is incredibly heavy and made of stainless steel, so uh, it's very hard uh, to do. And the first Falcon 9 flights, before they became a regular thing, doing 96 flights, uh, and the first booster reaching 20 reflights, those all went into the ocean, and a lot of them failed on the way there. But that's the iterative approach that SpaceX takes. And it's something that's very different in the industry. Starship's six second stage Raptor engines all started successfully and powered the vehicle to its expected orbit, becoming the first Starship to complete its full duration ascent burn. While coasting, Starship accomplished several of the flights, flight test additional objectives, including the opening and closing of the payload door, AKA the Pez dispenser, that's a scientific term, and initiating a propellant transfer demonstration. Starship did not attempt its planned on-orbit reflight of a single Raptor engine because the vehicle roll rate uh, during the coast. So when they had gotten up there, and we saw this with a lot of the footage, Starship was rolling. Uh, and some really amazing people on Twitter um, who were very talented with tracking and, and just taking a piece of footage and telling you what's really happening. They, Starship luckily had a camera on the uh, the end of its flaps here. And while those flaps were moving to help it go into the atmosphere, we could see down Starship. So we got to see the Earth. And you could see that Starship was just kind of in this roll. So I don't know if that meant there was a fuel leak and that was causing it to turn or if the attitude control system, which I've heard a lot of people online uh, state, that just wasn't working. And so Starship was kind of in this constant roll uh, up in orbit. Regardless, though, Starship went on to experience its first ever re-entry from space, providing valuable data on heating and vehicle control during hypersonic re-entry, and the live views of re-entry were made possible by the Starlink terminals that were operating on, Star on Starship. So I believe this was the first time ever that the plasma buildup of re-entry of that hypersonic compressible fluids thing that as an aerospace engineer, I learned, we saw graphs of it and interpretations of it, and we knew the theory behind it and how to calculate the force that it was experiencing, the heat that it's experiencing. 
But to see that streamed live in HD with basically the only reason the the video cut out is because the plasma blanket from reentry disrupted the signal from the Starlinks in orbit that were communicating with Starship also in orbit, deorbiting through the atmosphere to come back to Earth. And the flight's test conclusion came during entry and the last telemetry signals received via the Starlink from Starship at approximately 49 minutes into the mission. So that's what happened on test flight three. That's a lot of things that were successful in a test flight. And the reason why we believe that Starship's third test flight was so successful, and there's a lot of people calling it a failure or they lost Starship, the reality is, is that as of the morning before flight on March 14th, the best that SpaceX had ever done was to launch Starship and Super Heavy, light all 33 engines, hot separate the Starship from Super Heavy, and then continue on its way to orbit. But it did not get much further than that first test. But instead of just progressing linearly, right, just maybe having half of the stuff that had here, this Pi Day mission went above and beyond the progress that they've had from the first two flights and accelerates them at light speed towards what they need to do for the future. So this is where, this is why we think it's a success. Uh, There was a lot, there's a lot that Starship is being relied on for, and this is another reason why Starship is so important. Starship is going to be used and is being used for NASA's human landing system. They were chosen as the first human landing system that Artemis is going to be using to go back to the moon. Artemis, which is the next program of NASA following Apollo, to go back to the moon. And this is all built around this thing that we should get to the point, if we're going to build a space economy, if we're going to advance in space exploration and make life interplanetary, like what SpaceX mission statement is all about, NASA is building the infrastructure for us to be able to go to the moon, and then once we build and learn and get better to go into the moon, we use that ability and build the next infrastructure to go to Mars. And Mars is difficult because it basically takes nine months to get there, and then you have a small window in which you can return immediately for to fly back. And if you don't, you need to wait until the next time that that opportunity comes back to fly back. So Mars is, extreme, is way riskier than going to the moon. Artemis 1 happened last uh, two years ago. The first test was sending Orion to the moon and around and and re-entering the atmosphere and giving NASA the data it needs for Artemis 2, which is happening uh, as of right now next year in 2025. And that's going to be sending the first woman, the first person of color, and the first Canadian, including astronaut Reed Wiseman uh, of NASA. All Three of these astronauts will be going to orbit around the moon for the first time since Apollo program ended. Then Apollo 3 happens, and that's where Starship needs to be ready. And Starship is going to require much more testing. And and this test has brought them so much closer to it being used and the data being analyzed by NASA to send on Artemis 3 the astronauts on the Orion capsule to dock with Starship and then Starship needs to go down to the moon, land, and then reignite the engines to fly back to Orion capsule where the crew will get off and go home back to Earth. That would be the first time that would be used with humans on board to touch down on the moon instead of relying on the whole thing (laughs) to go from Earth on Starship and then to the moon and back, NASA's using it as a landing system. And it's also, it's picked Blue Origin and Blue Moon as the organization building the next human landing system. And we've got companies like Astrobotics and all these other companies that are doing things for NASA to build the infrastructure, to land things on the moon and get back into the rhythm of it because it's been over 50 years and we have to do this again. And we've seen... On all the latest human missions, on all the latest lunar missions, that 
China, India, Russia, Israel, Japan, us, all of these countries have been trying to land on the moon lately, and only India, China, and Japan have done it successfully. It just shows you that the moon is very hard, and so this test flight three doesn't prove that they're gonna make it to the moon, but this test brings them so much closer, so much quicker than the rate of progress that was happening before. So Starship is super important for us to get to the moon again. It's also not locked into governmental funding and taxpayer money where Starship is going to be funding a lot of its development with sending Starlink satellites into orbit. And that's where the real beauty of test flight three is we really saw the full, in some ways, the full architecture, the infrastructure of what SpaceX is doing just for themselves, but also in a way where the industry could access this information too, right? This rocket is going to be taking up these Starlink satellites into space so that it's cheaper for them. It's going to be able to fill out the full constellation so that the entire globe would be able to access the internet. Places that can't get land wires for, for internet, they're able to get it from space, from Starlink. But also, these Starlinks are going to be helping them get all of this data, all of this live HD streaming and video because of these satellites in space connecting it, and which means you don't need ground stations to be able to do that, which is basically how we do it now. And then that's going to make it so that if NASA finds itself, we're blessed right now. We're in this place where NASA has uh, so much great things going on. Funding is being allocated. Yes, there's 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 a layoff at JPL, and there are different projects right now because there are cuts, but the space industry is booming right now, where when we first started this podcast, it was not. <laughs> so if that ends up turning around and that momentum dries up from NASA... SpaceX has the opportunity to continue progressing towards sending humans into space long term. So in a lot of ways, this flight test just brings us that much closer to a more robust future for the progress of space that isn't tied to, you know, political whims or government funding or taxpayer money, right? If the U.S. decides, like we did in the Apollo program, that space isn't important anymore. That has happened before in the past. It's not impossible. And Starship and what SpaceX is doing really helps us stay away from a future where we could lose all of that progress again. So that's a lot to say that the Flight Test 3 was amazing. I was speechless at first. Clearly, I had a lot to say. But Thank you all for joining me. We'd love to know what you think here in the podcast. If you stayed this long, thank you. Uh, we love you. Um, but we'd love to hear from you since you're a hardcore fan. We'd love to know what you thought about the Test Flight 3. We'd love to know what you're excited about in the future. And even if there are things where you thought they could have done better, we, we'd like that feedback. So hit us up, todayinspacepodcast at gmail.com. And of course, on social media, Today in Space, on TikTok, Today in Space Pod, on Instagram and Twitter, and our Facebook page at Today in Space Podcast. Thank you for joining us. Spread love and spread science. And we'll be back for another episode of Today in Space. See ya.